Yeah. Welcome everyone, that was the Sonic 3 Orchestra, some underwater aquatic level zone music, which is perfectly suitable for this all-encompassing video on the diversity of one of my favorite groups of animals, the sea snakes. Basically, if you take a normal land-living venomous snake and give it the sea punk treatment, a sea snake is what you get. And this is a much underappreciated and vastly diverse group. And today, true to my word, we are going to review not only every species of sea snake, well almost, but also every other group of snake that habitually hunts in salt or bra brackish waters. So without much ado, let's go. Now we're not only gonna cover sea snakes proper, but we're also gonna cover all groups of snakes that hunt or dwell in water. So our first group of snakes, by the way, snakes are a tremendously diverse group and really I hope you will realize by the end of this presentation that there's no end to their beauty and unique diversity. And our first group is Acrocordidae, the elephant trunk snakes. Many people know these as the kind of flabby weird snakes and they are really a unique group. As you can see here, they're kind of on a different level from all the other groups of snakes. They are an outlying group. In fact, they are the most distinct group after the proper boas and pythons and whatnot. So a unique family. And they look like this, flabby with granulated skin. And look at its seal-like eyes, almost forward-facing big eyes and a kind of skin texture that looks like someone who's been underwater too long. But they are beautiful and this species is the Arafura elephant trunk snake, Acrocordus arafurae. It kind of lives underwater and because it's a snake, it can swallow prey items much, much bigger than itself. Are you a chunky or an imbecile? Anyway, then there's another species, Acrocordus granulatus, the granulated sea snake. No, the granulated elephant trunk snake. And this guy sometimes comes in these bandy shapes. Oh, by the way, all these species live in Southeast Asia to certain parts of Australasia. They're really unique. I mean, they almost spend all of their life in water. Sometimes so much that algae grows on them. And really, their skulls are quite unique. I mean, their eyes almost face forward. Their nostrils are really big. And... Sometimes they pop up on beaches, they live in swamps, mangrove swamps, rivers, and also proper marine habitats. They sometimes dwell there. Check, take a look at the little parasitic isopod latched on the butt of this fine specimen of Acrocordus granulatus. And look at this face, a face only a mother can love. Isn't he cute? Look at their eyes. This is the different snake, different species. The Javan elephant trunks, trunk snake, Acrocordus javanicus. And this is the derpiest looking one in my opinion. Just look at this face. Bimbi. Also notice how parallelly it looks almost like a, a seal, a fur seal. But of course it's mounted on a sea snake. Now notice how these body shapes and body plans and organ locations 
crop up in quite diverse and unrelated groups. That's one of the neatest things about evolution in general. And it should be a takeaway from these videos that the more you notice these rhymes in nature, the more wonderful everything seems. Sometimes I think there are white colored morphs of this particular species. Either they're found in the wild or someone has been breeding them, but they look even derpier. This is, I think, one of the cutest animals in existence, let alone snakes. And then we come to the honorary mansion in the Boidae family, the Boas. The gigantic anaconda, Eunectes murinus, sometimes dwells into salty waters, not habitually, but, you know, it's still here as an honorable mention because it's a gigantic snake. Anyway, then we come to this group, Dipsadinae, which is a peculiar, mostly South American and Caribbean group. And these snakes mostly live on land too, but they habitually hunt in swamps and brackish estuaries. So that's why they feature in this video. Here's a representative species, Farancia abacura. And in, when in the water, it looks like this. Notice how its tiny head, its thick body, and its tail is almost flattened side to side, like a little paddle. So even though this is like a land-dwelling weird snakelet, in the water it assumes a whole other shape and just swims and hunts quite successfully. Another nice thing about snake evolution to keep in mind that there's literally like dozens of weird groups, species, complexes that people know almost nothing about. But this is another species, Farancia erythrogramus, eating an eel. These snakes almost exclusively feed on fish or eels or so I have read. By the way, if I make any mistakes, please correct me in the comments section. And here's another group, another species in this group, Helicops angulatus with its derpy face once more. Another species of helicops. Well, there's a lot of species of helicops. We are only gonna see a few. Helicops leopardinus. But take a look at its shape. The head is long and the eyes are kind of placed in a weird hippo-like location. And it's just, I mean, these subtle differences, like you wouldn't see this in a snake that hunts on land. And then there's this species, about which not much is known, Pseuderix relictualis, the ring-necked Dipsadinae snake, or whatever. And then there's this one, Hydrops triangularis. Keep this name in mind, we're gonna see a similar name, Hydrophis, a lot in the coming parts of this talk. But this is a completely different group. Another little known snake that hunts in the seashore or by mangrove swamps or littoral habitats and can also live on land and it's quite weirdly colored. Another species from this family is Leptodeira rubricata which is cool and sometimes climbs up to trees. Then we got Trematorinus nigroluteus the black-eyed wonder nose snake or something but once again notice how its form is specialized for a water-going existence the head is quite narrow and the eyes are located towards the tip of the head and so is the nostril beautiful beautiful shape then we got Trematorhinus variabilis which lives in Cuba and has been on stamps beautiful snake and then we come to another honorary mention group, the water snakes or grass snakes. These are very familiar for those of us who live in the northwestern hemisphere of the world. Natricidae, the common grass snake. So in some parts of the world it's known as the water snake and it usually lives in rivers. But this is here as an honorary mention because sometimes it has been documented swimming in marine habitats. From this paper, you could note marine sightings of grass snakes. In an earlier natural history volume, Wood wrote 
This reptile will even take to the sea and has been noticed swimming between Wales and Anglesey. As if there's like a boat line between there. But anyways, by the way, these natural history notes, they're very, very entertaining and just extremely interesting to read. You always get these short, short articles displaying information about strange behaviors or anecdotes and they're the best part of life sciences as far as I'm concerned. Another fall sighting was n noticed near Dunwich and then someone commented it's not unusual to see grass snakes by the sea's edge and I guess a lot of species in this group kind of take to the sea sometimes maybe by accident but if we stop to study them all this talk would last a day so on we move Grainae. this is another little known group it's known mostly by this species Greya smitey which is this kind of powerful almost mosasaur looking freshwater snake which also sometimes takes to the salt sea salt water and for the best anecdotes of this species you should definitely read this really nice herpetological memoir by kate jackson a dedicated and a really talented writer as well a dedicated herpetologist she specializes in this african reptiles and amphibians mostly and her memoir mean and lowly things is just a fun really nice entertaining book to read in it she goes to study all these kinds of snakes and little frogs in this particular part of Africa. And the Greya snake is her most common catch. Like a, a regular part of the book goes like, oh, we, up, we woke up in the morning. We went, snake, we went to check our snake traps. We found Greya snakes again. So you think that Greya is the most common snake. But no, actually it's quite rare and phylogenetically speaking, it's also quite an interesting species. I mean, it doesn't have many relatives and not much is known about it. Mean and Lowly Things by Kate Jackson. You should definitely get this book. Kate Jackson, if by any way you are watching this video, I've been a fan of your works. Thank you for writing these books. And on we go. Now this is a nice group. Homalopsidae. So this group is maybe kinda close to the origin of proper sea snakes, but no one really knows. But they are like the most sea snake like non sea snake group ever. They live in, once again, Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, and parts of Australia. And of course, Australians have a wonderful name for them. To them, Homolopsid snakes are also known as Bacadams. That's B-O-C-K-A-D-A-M. Bacadam. Almost like a weird weapon. As if you're watching this strange war movie. And it's like, Bacadam, sir. 30 pounders. <laughs> like some sort of... Anyways. But these are really interesting snakes. I love them so much. Arguably almost more than proper sea snakes. Because they got all these weird skulls. Take a look at this face. I mean, if you don't study snakes too often, it might seem like any other snake head or any other reptile head. But notice how the eyes are oriented towards the front and top of the head. The nostrils can, if I'm not mistaken, open and close. And the lips have this really nice deep scales and the jaws are quite powerful almost as if like a little crocodile or a mos mosasaur mounted on a snake's body this is bitia hydroides one of the more common bacadams this is another rela related species cerberus australis it has this wonderful gray and black pattern and once again look at its head look at its face if you only saw the body, you might say, okay, any other boring snake. But if you look at the head, you see it's really specialized for something. In fact, these snakes 
have distinct specializations for catching and eating fish in water. Another species, Cerberus rhinocops, the it's named after the three-headed dog of Greek mythology, but it's very interesting that this name fell onto a snake. And if goo and war are your kinks, you might be the human reincarnation of a previous entity that lived as one of these snakes because all of their life is spent uh, swimming in goo, eating animals mm, as thick as their body, mm, thick, slimy, mm, mm, getting it into their bodies, and they're just a fun bunch. Anyways, Cerberus rhinocops has also been observed jumping, leaping from puddle to puddle in that famous BBC documentary, Life in Cold Blood, and it's just an all-around wonderful customer. Another related species, Cerberus schneideri, kind of has a different texture to it, but you can quite see the faces look alike. I'm skipping some species, you know, when I'm discussing really closely related forms, but that's life. Another species, Mirophis beneti, Bennett's mir snake or something. Once again, it's got this really nice deep lip and mouth structure. Like you could really see this head on a hippopotamus sized animal or like a gigantic marine reptile, but no, it's actually a quite tiny sea dwelling snake. These guys actually nest on land, but go to the sea to hunt. A, a distinct outlier in this group is Erpeton tentaculatum, the tentacled snake. This snake has two tentacles around its nose. Somehow it uses them to sense its prey or something, but no one really knows. They just live like this. They drift around like seaweed. And when a fish passes by, they swing in this amazing speed and just catch it. But just look at them. Enjoy while I take a sip of linden tea. These teas don't buy themselves, everyone. So please, if you like what I'm doing with these videos, consider supporting me on Patreon.com. Even a dollar of contribution really makes a difference. And another neat spe species in this group, Cantoria violacea. Okay, this guy, this Bakadam, is a specialist on pistol shrimps. Now you may ask, what is a pistol shrimp? Pistil shrimps, you can see one on the upper right hand side, are these shrimps with a weirdly asymmetrical form and believe it or not, I'm not making a joke here, by somehow exploiting a loophole in the laws of physics, these shrimp can click their claws so fast that they can, develop, de they can deliver acoustic shocks and somehow create sparks of light. And this snake, Cantoria violacea, is a specialist predator on pistol shrimps in these mangrove swamps. And I've read, may not be true, that it is attracted to the physics-defying sparks created by the claws of these tiny little shrimp. So it's like, of course, the shrimp is going around just hunting or little eating its little prey or when it's under threat it snaps its chick chick snapping arm but be careful where you shoot that weapon because you might just become a target for bacadams another 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 species miron richardsoni richardson's bacadam snake i guess once again beautiful form even more beautiful color another species Die, die Urostus Dussumieri. Dussumieri is the scientist who lent his name, I guess. But once again, nice animal. Gerarda Prevostiana is another species in this group. This is a really nice, big, big group. And I'm certain I'm skipping many species, but just this is the nice thing about nature. You get all these 
animals in this strange obscure groups and they come five by five i mean they got all these like distinct specializations and sub specializations so if you're developing these speculative evolution projects of your own this is a nice hint to take from mother nature it's almost like nature's verse that if you got something interesting repeat it like 15 or 20 times just subtle variations Homolopsus Meral J. Coxi, unpronounceable name, but that is really the species name, is a beautiful example of this family, and it's got this mask-like scale pattern on its face, which is really cool. Homolopsis Melgcoxi. I guess this was named by the Geonosians of Star Wars the Universe. Anyways, then we got like this really bizarre, bizarre snake looks like a fat little crocodile tadpole. The Vietnam Mekong River snake. It's just unbelievable. I have read that this species spends much more of its time in water. So it's like even more aquatic. And it's really short. But the head is really thin. Then it really broadens almost like a weird miniature hybrid between a plesiosaur and a crocodile then you got pseudoferania polylepis another species and then you got probably the most famous fordonia leucobalia now this guy is a specialist predator on crabs and it hunts them with a very distinct and kind of gruesome method so it just slithers around you know and bumps into a crab because this guy hunts in mangrove swamps and those are like full of crabs. Now, snakes, as we know, cannot properly chew. So they have to swallow their prey in one big gulp. The trouble is, the snakes this guy... Uh, no, no, no. The crabs this guy eats are quite big. Almost bigger than the snake itself. So, by the way, this is another variety of the snake. Apparently their colors are quite variable. But this is like the supersonic variant i don't know maybe it collected all the chaos emeralds well it certainly needs to do some sort of superpower because when it finds a crab oh by the way this guy was named by this amazing scientist john edward gray who just ascribed names to new species like there was no tomorrow if you go to wikipedia there's like more than 1000 pages in a category called taxa named by john edward gray and this guy's spiel was just making shit up as he went along as one researcher quoted john edward gray was well known for inventing many apparently meaningless scientific names and this particular species fordonia is one of them when you read about its the meanings of its name fordonia it's like sounds like something but doesn't mean anything this guy named many species like this like if you study these eponym dictionaries of reptiles or other animals you get a lot of entries that say no particular meaning because this guy was out there just giving new names like it was a supermarket checkout counter god i wish i lived back then oh the names i would invest invent I mean, there would come these snakes and insects and crabs and I would give them these weird, scary sounding and absolutely meaningless names. I would name them things like Kahidron or Va or Yaramuyeo, things like this. This guy lived the life, ah, the 19th century. Anyway, back to Fordonia, the cool sounding snake with a gruesome feeding method on crabs now this particular snake has some of the thickest and strongest teeth found in any snake if you study this kind of funny diagram on the left hand side you could see Fordonia's teeth which are like compared to other species really thick and stout like a dirk like a dagger because it eats things with an exoskeleton if you eat things that are soft, you got little needle teeth to kind of catch and hold on to them. 
or if you're a generalist, according to this diagram, you eat infinity. Anyways, what Fordonia does is it kind of suddenly grasps claws and pushes them against its body and twists arms and legs off and eats them and then leaves the rest of the crab still alive get fucked to rot by the side of the swamp nature is really gruesome this way and there has been research documenting Fordonia as the one of the few snakes that can eat without swallowing f without swallowing food entirely it's one of the few snakes that can tear its prey apart and these are pictures of Fordonia Fordoning some hapless crab it's really sad I mean I know nature is cruel but I really feel sad for the crabs I mean to have all your arms and legs torn off one by one by the silly named snake and then just cast aside but don't worry sometimes crabs have the upper hand here you can see a big crab tearing a either it's a Fordonia or a related snake into half the age-old blood feud between these two ancient clans goes on and now we come to the main part we come to the money shot Elapidae the big big family of extremely venomous snakes known in the old world from cobras boom slangs mambas these are elapid snakes and in Australia who boy these guys go completely wild they got all sorts of desert living species forest living species that like in Australia these elapid snakes occupy niches normally filled by vipers so you got these viper like snakes that are not vipers the weird thing about elapids is that they have produced many sea going forms as well now we're gonna see them all now this is a regular elapid snake from Australia so this is not a sea snake it's just an example to see what these guys look like they're like full of venom really venomous snakes that's why Australia is kind of dangerous in that respect I guess then you got these other elapids that kind of resemble sea snakes and hunt in swamps this guy really beautiful species by the way Ephalophis grey or grey ae I've heard I've read both names so it's like similar to this snakes like from the same lineage but it's adapted for a swamp dwelling life and once more notice how the eyes are kind of moving towards the tip of the head and the top of the head the nostril is doing this weird thing and the mouth is deepening while the head is getting longer you can recall this shape from the Bakadam snakes we saw earlier which are not related but they have assumed a similar form and what's more these guys also have these paddle like flat tails it's really bizarre and beautiful now this guy is an elapid that's not directly related to the two main radiations of elapid sea snakes but this guy also lives in swamps and sometimes hunts in the sea to make things more complicated now we got two major groups of sea snakes descended from elapid ancestors the first one Laticaudinae these are more rela closely related to krite snakes I guess let's look at them this is one of them Laticauda colubrina the the banded sea crate now the cool thing about these guys they look like completely adapted for a life under the waves but they can also dwell on land because the scales they have beneath their body are flat so they can still move about on land now you don't get that in the other group of sea snakes we're gonna look at oh by the way this guy Laticauda colubrina the sea, sea crate is known from this amazing incident now this is native to the basically the western pacific ocean but somehow in 1993 it was reported reported from a greek island in the mediterranean 
Now this is such a vast feat of dispersal that like I couldn't believe this when I first read this report and I even thought that maybe you know it's fake but this kind of thing is difficult to fake so I actually remember holding this session with snake researchers and biologically literate people that I know and the conclusion we arrived was that this guy was probably trapped in the ballast tank of a big tanker you know tankers move from continent to continent and they take seawater in as ballast and somehow this snake got in there and was ejected when the ship arrived in Greece and this way one of these snakes ended up in quite a far part of the world but now I think as seawaters around the world keep getting warmer and now we also have the Suez Canal you know it's not unlikely for more incidents of this type to happen in the future we could get more tropical Australasian sea snakes crossing the Arabian Sea and ending up in the Mediterranean and this is another species of sea crate the blue banded sea crate Laticauda, Laticaudata now you can see these guys I mean they're quite different from all the bocadums and all the other snakes we saw before they really are becoming something else and here's another one a really big burly type Laticauda semifasciata I mean what does this profile remind you of it's almost like a chunky slim down miniature plesiosaur it's amazing but we're gonna see more of that then you got the black color then somehow more terrestrial laticauda crocary i mean these these snakes are the best they can live in the open sea and they can also climb trees and stuff they're like really mobile in that respect and you don't get many creatures that do that and then we come to the real group the the royal real group of sea snakes now these are fully marine adapted descendants of those elapid snakes we talked about but there's something weird here like no one knows how it happened how these guys evolved and in one book actually all land living snakes in australia are grouped under this family hydropidae i mean the assumption being that these snakes somehow made it to the sea and then came out of the sea in australia and colonized all the dry land habitats so all these according to this scheme of course all these desert living viper like snakes are probably descendants of sea snakes according to this really heterodox classification i observed in one of the recent books about snakes in general i don't think that's the case by the way i think these are like proper elapids that went to the sea once and that was that but anything is possible you know people used to say that these guys were descendants of mosasaurs and ancestors of all other snakes now that's extremely unlikely but that's how i mean stranger things have happened in the past so that's just interesting interesting to think about and as we examine the proper sea snakes here's one outlying species hydralops darwiniensis once again it's got this weird armored almost turtle like head the long muscular body that terminates in a paddle what a wonderful animal this is like we are living snake territory now these things are becoming something else another little known ancestral or dare i say basal form parahydropis martoni and then we get to the proper proper sea snakes we get the big genus aipisurus this is aipisurus aprefrontalis which people assumed were extinct until recently then it was photographed and discovered again this is aipisurus duboisi uh, like a proper seagoing snake now 
according to some papers and articles I read, this particular species has the most potent venom of all sea snakes. Because remember, these guys hunt in the sea. They have to catch fish, but they don't have any hands or nothing. So once they bite something, they want to make sure that that thing dies pretty rapidly. And in order to do that, they inject a lot of venom and the venom itself is really, really effective. So in that dark way, sea snakes are some of the most venomous of all snakes. Fortunately, they don't attack people, they don't bite people as readily as some other snakes. But, you know, in fact, some of them are quite reluctant to bite people. But, you know, they're like John Wick. If you push them far enough, they say, boo, and you're dead. And there is no coming back from that death, let me tell you. This is a close-up of this same species, Aipisurus duboisi. And you can see this species lives in Australia. And you can see where, I guess... Animals like this must have been one of the inspirations for Aboriginal art, which comes in these really dazzling, beautiful, spotty patterns. But check out its lips. I mean, what a cool, weird animal. Check this out. This jagged, buzzsaw-like edge. There's flaps covering the ears. Oh, wait, snakes don't have ears. There's just flaps here. And the nostrils can be closed. Up, down. That's really a unique adaptation for these guys. And it's just gnarly, just a beautiful, strange thing of its own. And then you got the leaf-scaled sea snake, Aipisurus folioscoama, about which maddeningly little is known, but it's got big scales like the leaves of a tree. And just look at it, man. I mean, if someone showed me this thing as a speculative evolution thing, I would say, wow, what an imagination. Here's another picture, the, the big... I guess the scales deter the attachment of barnacles or other marine parasites because a lot of times sea snakes are found with like, like scary loads of parasitic barnacles or copepods attached to their heads and maybe the big scales deter them, I don't know. Another species, Ipisurus tenuis, then there's the big stocky sea snake, Aipisurus laevis. Now you can see that these sea snakes are completely marine. They cannot even crawl about on the land because their bellies are narrow. Like they would have nothing to stand up on. Check this out, how, how weird. And it's like this flattened whip almost. So these guys all swim around in coral reefs and stuff and hunt fish. And this guy is a really big one. I mean, check this face out. And it has been documented that this particular species, Aipisurus laevis, can even bite through swimsuits. You know, in Australia, everything is deadly. So actually, if you go diving or surfing, you have to wear these neoprene skin suits that cover all of your body. But these guys apparently are quite big. I mean, three meters long or something. Some accounts say they're as thick as a man's arm or leg. And you know, if they bite you, they can bite through your swimsuit. So be careful. And look at this face. You got any points, mate? Anyways, then there's the mosaic sea snake, Aipisurus mosaicus, which is kind of related, but has just this nice marbled body coloration. And big scales too. And then there's the dark colored Aipisurus fuscus. And I guess there's a dozen other species that I just couldn't have time or just images of. Then we go to this other genus of hydropid sea snakes. Emidocephalus annulatus. These are called the turtle-headed sea snakes because their heads really look like turtles, I guess. If you're blind in one eye, their heads don't look like anything I've seen. Look at this face. They got this spike-like scale in front of the mouth. And they're specialist predators on fish eggs. So these guys, they look like some futuristic alien thing. And 
They live on caviar, basically. How cool. This is another species, Emidocephalus annulatus. Almost has a beak. I mean, look at this thing, man. The scales. Whew, face is almost like that of an insect. And another species of the turtle-headed sea snake, an Emidocephalus annulatus. Here, a male and female are seen swimming together. What a lovely, lovely dance of life. Then you got the recently discovered Emidocephalus aurarius, which is really ornate. I mean, check these colors out, man. Black and orange, white, gray, these spots and these remarkable yellow scales. It's almost like pixel art. And I'm sure there's like dozens of more quote-unquote species awaiting documentation off the shores of Australia. Australia is a really big and really underpopulated place. It's bigger than continental Europe, yet like only 20 million people live there. And don't even get me started around about the reefs and islands around the place, you know. There must be many more species awaiting description. And this guy, Emidocephalus Ijimae, is named after this really based Japanese scientist, Isao Ijima. He was one of the founders of zoology in general in his home country. And he was also, he made enormous advancements in the study of parasites, fish and reptiles as well. And here the quote says, Professor Ijima devoted himself to the education of those pioneering young students in the early days of zoology in Japan. He wrote a manual of zoology in Japanese, one of his masterpieces. In it, we can clearly recognize the great contribution made to the advancement of zoology in his country. So, respect once more to Ijima-san. Also, if you're interested in nature in any kind or form, make sure to study the lives of people who describe these animals, you know, because new species don't pop up of their own. But there's usually some very eccentric, very talented, highly intelligent and unique individuals behind each species, family, group or evolutionary classification. Now we get to the big, 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 big group. In this family, Hydropidae, or Hydropinae, in this group, there's this one mega genus that contains a lot of species, and they're all bizarre in their own right. Now, until recently, these were grouped under five or six different genuses, but someone did a study, and now they're all united under Hydropis, and Hydropis just has so many species like and we're gonna see a lot of them but there's almost like 50 or something more and i guess that's just the way herpetology rolls in these days because every decade something gets revised either new genera are split or grouped together i guess this is what happens when you have people studying these groups of animals as a career how are you going to advance your career you cannot always discover new species. So what you do is you go back to previous classifications, lump or split species, or do some genetic analysis. I don't know. But, I mean, it's a common knowledge in herpetology, not just with sea snakes, but with anything like toads or geckos, whatever. Like, go to sleep for five years, come back, and you will never recognize a species again. And this happens so many times. But anyways, this guy used to be known as Astrotia stokesi, Stokes' sea snake. We now know it as Hydrophis stokesi, and it's a big, powerful, burly predator on active fish. This is what it looks like in real life. And you can see it's almost like a mosasaur that washed ashore. And then you can see it's also plagued by these barnacles and parasites. Maybe that's why some sea snake species have these gnarly feather-like or like buzzsaw-like scales. So the thing with Hydrophis in general, that they come in two forms. You got the 
big head snakes like this guy or you got the gimby head snakes which have like i mean check this out it almost looks like a little plesiosaur the body is really thick and but suddenly the front part is really thin and like string like these are specialist predators of burrowing eels what happens was people used to think that the gimby headed ones are one group and the big chunky headed ones are one group but of course that's not the case apparently gimby and chunky heads evolved more than once in different clusters of these things so it's now just a mess now if you know anything about prehistoric marine reptiles you would also know that the same thing is the case with plesiosaurs and pliosaurs they used to think that the big-headed marine reptiles and you know long-necked marine reptiles were two separate things but now people know that there's big-headed ones in gimby-headed groups and gimby-headed ones in big-headed groups and it's all just a big mess but that's nature for you continuing with hydrophis stokesi stokes the sea snake you can see that this is like a powerful like it's like a fish almost or a mosasaur what a, what a beautiful beautiful animal then you got this hydrophis major used to be dysteria that this is like an intermediary form you see most of its body is chunky but the head is kind of slimmer so that's interesting that's what it looks like look at its jaws Brrr. and a cool thing about these snakes is that let's see there is an article in which grandmothers living in if i'm not mistaken a pacific island were requested to help with collecting sea snakes okay so these grandmas were really like knowledgeable and they knew their way around the sea so they were far more efficient in collecting these sea snakes and the article says as soon as the grandmothers got to work we realized that we had massively underestimated the abundance of greater sea snakes in the bay photographs taken by the grandmas and one of us identified more than 140 sea snakes over a 25 month period so you know these snakes are far more abundant than we think probably now this is another species hydrophis schistosus used to be anhydrina but again another big head big head form this is what it looks like and then we got hydrophis zweifeli also used to be known as anhydrina now this guy really has a goofy face i guess all hydrophis species kind of do have a goofy face but this guy has its goofy face in a really pronounced form you see there's this weird cleft and people say this is used to allow it to efficiently capture spiny fish so the spikes don't hurt the snake or something or maybe it's just to help its tongue move in and out faster or maybe it's both i don't know but certainly i know this are you a gimby or an imbecile i know you are both gimby imbecile anyways then we got the beautifully colored hydrophis chirolacens i guess it's a rule that when you have a sea snake you must also have this kind of brightly colored version of the same thing and then you, there is hydrophis cyanocinctus now people say this snake somehow lost its venomous adaptations i've read about it but i'm not really sure this species is also known for a peculiar adaptation so it's got this network of blood rich veins around its head and surrounding the brain and people took mri scans of these things and they showed these weird blood vessels that people had never expected or seen before and they say it's probably an adaptation related to their diving lifestyle maybe for heat conservation but nobody is really certain it's just one of those weird surprises these weird curveballs that nature throws us anyway onwards onwards 
Then there's Hydrophis zebulkovi with a distinctly giraffe-like pattern and the gimbi narrowhead, another eel predator, I guess. Then there's Hydrophis donaldi, which is kind of more like an intermediate, medium thick form. But this guy has almost armor-like scales, almost like chain mail. Check this out. And then there's the elegant sea snake, Hydrophis elegans. Then there's the striped sea snake, Hydrophis fasciatus. And this is just bizarre and beautiful. Look at this thing. How surreal. If someone showed this to me as a drawing, I would say, I guess you draw your snake wrong. Its body is almost five times thicker than its four parts. This guy is like a living plesiosaur. Of course, plesiosca plesiosaur skeletons were much different. But still, I mean, this is a unique animal. It reminds me, this photograph really reminds me of this beautiful picture by Elihu Vedder, a very talented artist, called The Lair of the Sea Serpent. And look at this picture, it's just the big sea serpent hiding on the beach. Maybe beached or maybe just living there. Well, it does look like one of these hydrophis guys, maybe one of the chunky head ones, but the eyes if you look, are almost like those of a monitor lizard. Maybe they need to be located closer to the tip and then it would make a convincing giant hydrophid snake. But anyways, Elihu Vedder, check him out. He's a great, great symbolist artist. Also has a lot of fantastic art of demons, angels, stuff like that. Beautiful artist. Then you got the extremely gimby-headed Hydrophis gracilis. Look at this thing. I mean, it's like a joke. How does this thing even live? Like, if you found it, actually, here's this picture. It's quite tiny, too. <laughs> Swimming around in a bucket. Looks like a tapeworm, almost, or a leech. But no, it's a seagoing snake with a very unique set of adaptations. It's like someone glued or badly photoshopped two different snakes together. Unbelievable. Then you got Hydrophis lapemoides, an intermediate grade sea snake. Then you got another gimby form, Hydrophis mammillaris. And I'm just skipping so many species here, but there's many more. And I guess there will be many more described in the future. Then you got the black headed sea snake, Hydrophis melanocephalus, another gimby headed form. And then you got the weird ornate ones. These guys are like super burly, super muscular, and their body is covered with these little spikes, probably to, probably to deter parasites. But in the same genus, you got this guy, and you got this guy. Come on! What a crazy, crazy world. Oh. Here you can see their adaptation for a marine life. All of these snakes, not just this one, can switch on and off their nostrils. Click, click. So I thought that was really cool. And these guys are virtually helpless on land. Hydrophis curtis, or used to be known as Lapamis curtis, is another one of those burly, super armored burly ones. This is a close up. Man, this guy. It's like this mosasaur almost. A closest thing to one you have today. Then you got this. I mean, you got this big headed crocodile type beast almost. Then you got this. <coughs> Hydrophis parviceps. The tiny gimby headed one. Then you got these even weirder ones, which are kind of like in a similar form to these burly guys. They have the spiky, almost armor like skin, but the head is smaller. And the scales around the head are almost like feathers or spines. And the eye, look at this mad stare it has. What a, what a wonderful beast. Unbelievable. Guys, if you're like deciding what to study in college, and if you see this video, if you want to study sea snakes or marine reptiles in general, you will not have an unrewarding life. Go and 
study biology, zoology, or if you've studied your BA, if you got the means to do it, pursue your higher education researching sea snakes. And your life will be spent looking at these things. And it's going to be a great life. Look at this. Oh my God. Then you got uh, many outlying species. You got Hydrapus semperi, which is found in a lake in the Philippines. So it was probably isolated in that lake and it evolved into a distinct species, Hydrophis semperi. Semperfy marine! Anyways, then you got Hydrophis sibawensis, which is native not in the sea, but in a river. The Sibau River in, I believe, ah, so bad of me, but it's either in Vietnam or Indonesia. Uh, forgive me for these mistakes. I'm reading these podcasts. I'm not reading. I'm just speaking. I'm making them from the from my memory. And forgive me for this error. It's native to the Sibau River. And it's a neat example of these marine snakes secondarily entering rivers or lakes and just evolving into different species there. And there's probably more of these things that we haven't noticed. Then you got the beautifully colored gimbi-headed Hydrophis spiralis. I mean, just look at this. Look at this beautiful yellow colored. And just when you're imagining the lives these animals leave, lead, they're crawling among these anemones, among corals, interacting with dozens of different crayfish, normal fish, eating some of them. And there must be a lot of unique interactions going between these snakes and other species in their habitats. It's just beautiful. Then you got uh, Hydrophis giordoni, used to be known as Kerilia giordoni. And then you got the viperine sea snake, Hydrophis viperinus, probably named so due to its pattern or just overall look, but just a really cool animal. Then you got the big-headed sea snake, and I don't know if this is a fully grown individual or a juvenile, but it's a really weird thing. It's like a tadpole or a little shark almost. It's got a huge head, a tiny tail, and it's just pew, completely unique kind of thing. Then you got the little known Hydrophis anomalus. I don't know why they named it so. I tried to find more information about it, but nah, nada. If you know any interesting facts about any of these species, please share them in the comment section below. And then you got the famous celebrity among these snakes. Now this guy used to be known as Pelamis platurus or Pelamis platura, the ocean going open sea sea snake. So among all these sea snakes we've seen, this guy lives in the most open, distant part of the ocean. It gives live birth in the middle of the sea, doesn't even need to come ashore to land, not to do anything. And it lives practically all over the world's o tropical oceans. Some are known from Cuba, some are known from the seas around Australia or South America or South Africa, everywhere generally. And it's got this really beautiful body shape, really beautiful color and really aesthetic looking head form as well. Almost like a little crocodile head mounted onto this bizarre eel-like body. Just look at it, I mean. And then you got a distinct subspecies living in the waters around Cuba or the Caribbean that's bright yellow, Hydrophis platurus xanthos. It's almost like a moray eel. Look at this thing. And then, to make things even more complicated, there are these golden but blue-eyed varieties seen in the Arabian Sea. This is from the Gulf of Oman. But they are distinct from the Hydrophus, Hydrophis platurus xanthos, this guy. But they're just, like, beautiful. I wish we lived on a flat earth and the world was surrounded by tropical islands and just shallow oceans 
for light years, you know, just flat, infinite ocean. And I would just wanted, I just want these infinite seas to be full of infinite sea snakes. Man, what would you get? All these gimby heads, golden, crocodile headed ones, big tadpole like swimming things. Woof! Can you imagine? Then, I mean, I've seen a lot of images. This one I just saw on a Google search. Didn't fit any of the species I just showed you. Hydrophis species, SP. And I'm certain there's many more species awaiting description. Or maybe these numerous species could all interbreed with each other and they're just, quote-unquote, naturally occurring morphs. No one really knows. And then we come... Fossil species. Ah, you didn't think I was going to let you go that easy, did you? So, from the end of the age of dinosaurs onwards, you got fossils of snakes occurring in marine deposits, but these are almost certainly not related to the sea snakes we have today. They were independently evolved seagoing snakes. This is one of them, Eupodophis, kind of like a middle size snake kind of thing. You got Pachyopis with the thick bones. Tick, 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 tick. Here depicted on the beautiful stamp from Yugoslavia, a country cruelly and wantonly destroyed, tacitly allowed to destroy itself by Europe so that it wouldn't compete with the EU. You know, pax onto all of your houses. Anyways, then you got Pachyrachis, the another very early form that's known from marine deposits and maybe it had little legs i don't know what's this thing anyways and then you got archaeopis another just strange seagoing snake kind of thing i'm sure that this story we saw with the hydrophids and all those other families of bacadems and um, sea crates and all those must have been repeated like dozens of times in the history of snake evolution and before snakes existed i'm certain there were other legless lizard-like things that occupied sea snake-like niches then you got these giant forms like these are known only from backbone bits but they're enough to indicate that there were some really big snakes swimming about the seas of the ancient world this is one of them pterosphenus then you got Paleophis, known from these chunky fossil vertebra found in marine deposits. And in real life, people expect maybe it looked like this. Boo! Take a look at this guy. Now, I would really like to see it alive. If it was this big, maybe it didn't actually need to look like these sea snakes we have today. Maybe it looked like this giant legless mosasaur. Or maybe when it got this big maybe its tail fin had this kind of crescent like form who knows who knows then as a final as we approach the end of our presentation we have cryptids now there's a lot of sea serpents but one of them was even scientifically described in a sort of way scoliophis the gloucester sea serpent of north america seen between 1817 and 1819 and there's just a cottage industry devoted to studying reports of this creature like people saw these great big snakes or they thought they saw snakes maybe they were seeing whale erections i don't know and now a little bit later someone caught this snake and described it report of a committee of the linnean society of new england relative to a large marine animal supposed to be a serpent seen near Cape Ann, Massachusetts in August 1817. So you got all these sightings and then someone described this snake from a strange specimen, but it turned out it was actually a, I guess it was a fake, but it was this regularly occurring snake with a backbone disorder, or they said. 
I don't know. But people really were I, I, describing this thing scientifically back in the day. Scoliopus Atlanticus killed on the seashore near Boston in 1870 and at that time supposed to be the young of the sea serpent. But then it turned out to be just a regular snake with deformations that were probably man-made. I guess it was the Americans way. Remember, this is 1817, 1817, yes. And this was the Americans way of maybe justifying these sightings with the discovery of a new species. So maybe, you know, they could compete in the international arena with this impressive new discovery. I don't know. But I mean, there are lots of anecdotes and accounts of this great sea serpent here. You can see someone's rowing and shooting at this serpent with a musket. <laughs> Anyways, and there are a lot of accounts. I mean, believe me, if you if you search for the Gloucester Sea Serpent, you, you come across lots of studies, lots of current day revisions of past publications. And, you know, people just enjoy reading about this sea snake reports, I guess. I mean, who wouldn't? Look at that. I saw a strange marine animal that I believe to be a serpent, Captain Solomon. His head appeared much like the head of a sea turtle, and he carried his head from 10 to 12 inches above the surface of the water. Amos Story. Sounds like a OnlyFans name. Anyways, but it's really interesting that like people were definitely involved in a mania of snake sightings. I don't know what they were seeing. It almost certainly wasn't a gigantic sea snake, but the way Amos' story here describes a sea turtle's head, it's really interesting because, as we saw before, some sea snakes really do have sea turtle-like heads. Another person says, When immersed in the water, his speed was greater, moving, I should say, at the rate of a mile or two, or at most three minutes. At, at the rate of a mile in two or at most three okay whatever another person says if he should be taken I have no doubt that his length will be found 70 feet at least I should not be surprised if he should be found 100 feet long oh talk about the tall tail and this guy this is the best I had a good gun I took good aim second amendment I aimed at his head and I think I must have hit him. Where's the body, Matthew? Where's the body? If you hit him, where's the snake? I don't know. But this is just a really fun story. Let's not devote too much time to it. But reports of these sea snakes continued until the 1930s. Sea monster leaves fisherman Popeye, Nantucket, Massachusetts. The 1937 Sea Serpent, the marine monster season, was officially open today. Fisherman Bill Manville came in here, Popeye, and what he said, he had seen a couple of miles southeast of this island. In Bill's own words, it was green great sea monster, which reared its head several times of a starward bow before turning seaward. You know all these newspapers actually. In the past, there used to be this job description known as a rewrite man. So you would go work in these newspapers, especially in America, this was like a common thing. Imagine you got these reports, let's say there was a fire and part of one house was described. Now, your job as a rewrite man, like this is a genuine thing that happened in, in media, your job as a rewrite man would be to take these stories and rewrite them so that they would be more attractive to the public reader. Because remember, there was no TV, there was no OnlyFans, there was no internet, YouTube, nothing. So you had to write stories in an attractive way. And it was common practice, I mean, until I believe 1950s or something, for quote-unquote journalists to exaggerate these claims to make for good reading. The job of a rewrite man. So if the fire just burned one wing of the house, the rewrite man would write like, the fire destroyed the house completely. Two children were trapped inside, crying, 
until the firemen boldly rushed in and rescued them just before the side awning of the house collapsed. Like this really happened. Fake news? It's not just today's problem. So I get in these sea snake mania sightings. A lot of rewrite men were also at work. I couldn't say rewrite women because, you know, ladies did not take journalistic jobs in that day and age. It was just the uh, just those times. I don't know. Anyways, in conclusion, we saw a lot of snakes. We saw a lot of sea snakes. We saw the beautiful parallel evolution of similar characteristics and beautiful aesthetics over and over. As these snakes relentlessly took to the waves, the mangrove swamps, they tore legs off these crabs, ate them, they evolved into be bizarre turtle heads, crocodile heads, gimby heads and tick heads and shark heads and whatever. And it's just beautiful. And that's just one part of snake diversity. Look, these all four images, they're different groups of snakes, each as unique and distinct and with as deep histories and evolutionary backgrounds as those sea snakes we just observed. So, you know, then, then, then congratulations, 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 congratulations. You have managed to listen to my rambling for almost an hour, but you've also seen this one beautiful fact. Snakes are poetry, evolution is poetry. The more you study these things, the more details emerge and the more beautiful and engrossing it is. I mean, for me, when I was a kid and when I read my first books about the evolution of snakes or lizards, whatever, the more I study these minute details that made these animals unique, the positioning of the eyes, the shapes of the eyes, the sizes of the eyes, the shape of the face, the skull, how they made their unique ways of life possible, the more I studied these the, the rush I got it from was immense. And, you know, it's really something I felt I could devote my life to studying. So, you know, if you're watching this podcast right now, in the year of our Lord, 2022, and if you're a student, if you're as impressed as I was, consider pursuing a career, studying herpetology or any other group of animals. It's really like the more you look into things, you know, you say, ah, snake. A head and a long body, that's it. It's not it. Snakes are unbelievably diverse. Unbelievable. And the same goes for lizards. Same goes for beetles. Same goes for moths. Same goes for any animal or any plant. Snakes are poetry. Evolution is poetry. And that's it, everyone. Thanks for watching. Now, you know, I took all this time to research these snakes, make this presentation, record it. So in exchange, if you were as moved by my talk as you were, please consider donating to me on patreon.com. If everything went all right, actually, my Patreon supporters saw this video a couple of days before the rest of you come and folk. But if you join on Patreon, you can find many more free stuff. Heck, I'm going to post this PowerPoint presentation on Patreon. If you support me on Patreon, you can download it and make the same presentation to your friends or someone you like to impress. Man, if you download this PowerPoint and show it to your loud one and just narrate it as I used to, and then if you sing the Sonic the Hedgehog Aquatic Ruin Zone song, that person will go down on you that very second. You will be in love forever. You will have 22 children. I don't know. But that's that's the effect my PowerPoints have. You know? Screw Netflix. Go. You want to have CM Cozeman and chill? You want to have snakes and chill? That's the way to go. Support me on Patreon and you can download this PowerPoint. And see future projects before the rest of the general population. Anyways, I hope you had a good time. Uh, snakes are cool. Life is beautiful. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs>